Unless you've studied it, most of us are never taught how to evaluate science, or at least how to parse the good from the bad. Yet it is something that dictates every area of our lives. It is vital for helping us understand how the world works. So in this video, you'll learn through two examples of bad science, how to point out some of the common red flags, and then we'll look at some of the hallmarks of good science so you can learn how to sort the signal from the noise. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's first examine the growing reason for the mistrust of scientific authority, which has two main causes. First and foremost, a lot of the mistrust is based on a misunderstanding of how science works. People just can't understand every aspect of a scientific field and avenue at play. Secondly, there's a lack of awareness of how to evaluate its quality. There is a difference between bad science and pseudoscience. Bad science is a flawed version of good science with the potential for improvement. That's key. It follows the scientific method only with a few errors or biases. Often it's produced with the best of intentions, just by researchers who are responding to skewed incentives. Pseudoscience, on the other hand, has no basis in the scientific method. It does not attempt to follow standard procedures for gathering evidence, which we'll go over some of those later. The claims involved may be impossible to disprove, and pseudoscience focuses on finding evidence to confirm it, disregarding disconfirmation. While the tools and pointers in this video are geared towards identifying bad science, they will also be helpful with easily spotting pseudoscience. The first example of bad science is that of flawed science from psychology. A 2010 study entitled Power Posing, Brief Nonverbal Displays, Effects, neuroendocrine levels and risk tolerance, claimed open expansive poses cause participants to experience elevated testosterone levels, reduced cortisol levels, and greater risk tolerance. The abstract concluded that a person can, via a simple two minute pose, embody power and instantly become more powerful. The idea took off. It spawned hundreds of articles, videos, and tweets espousing the benefits of including a two minute power pose in your day. Yet at least 11 follow-up studies, 11 failed to replicate the results. None found that power posing has a measurable impact on people's performance in tasks or on their physiology. While subjects did, however, report a subjective feeling of increased powerfulness, their performance did not differ from subjects who did not strike a power pose. In other words, they said they were feeling more powerful, but their performance didn't differ from those who didn't perform a power pose at all. The notion of power posing is exactly the kind of nugget that spreads fast online. It's simple, it's free, it promises dramatic benefits with minimal effort, and it's intuitive. It kind of makes sense. Yet, when you examine the details of the original study, it reveals a whole parade of red flags. The study had 42 participants. That might be reasonable for preliminary or pilot studies, but it is in no way sufficient to prove anything. That's the size of most high school classes sometimes in America. It was not blinded. Feedback from participants was self-reported, which is notorious for being biased and inaccurate, as you could imagine. There's also a clear correlation causation issue. Powerful, dominant animals tend to use expansive body language that exaggerate their size, but that doesn't mean it's the pose making them powerful. Likewise, the original studies claim that a power pose makes someone instantly become more powerful is suspiciously strong. This is one of the examples of psychological studies related to small tweaks in our behavior that have not stood up to the scrutiny. We're not singling out the power pose study as being unusually flawed or in any way fraudulent. It's a strong example of why we should go straight to the source if we want to understand research. Coverage elsewhere of the study may not give details on how the study was performed or acknowledge any shortcomings because it would ruin the story. We're all susceptible to taking these scientific results seriously without checking on the underlying validity of the science. So what can you learn from this about spotting bad science? It is a good idea to be skeptical of research promising anything too dramatic or extreme with minimal effort, especially without substantial evidence. If it seems too good to be true, it most likely is. The world of weight loss science is one where bad science is rampant. We all know, deep down, 
that we cannot circumnavigate the need for healthy eating and exercise. There's no magic bullet, yet we all are looking for one. Let's take a look at one study that is a masterclass of bad science. Entitled Randomized Double Blind Placebo Control Linear Dose Crossover Study to Evaluate the Efficacy and Safety of a Green Coffee Bean Extract in Overweight Subjects. <gasps> On the face of it and to the untrained eye, the study may appear legitimate, it has a lot of big words and is in a seemingly reputable journal, but it is rife with serious problems. The FDA recommends studies relating to weight loss consist of at least 3,000 participants receiving an active medication and another 1,500 receiving a placebo, all for a minimum period of 12 months. This study used a mere 16 subjects with no clear selection criteria or explanation. None of the researchers involved had medical experience or had published related research. They did not disclose the conflict of interest inherent in the funding source. It didn't cover efforts to avoid any confounding factors. It is vague about whether subjects change their diet and exercise, showing inconsistencies. The study was not double blind, despite claiming to be, and it has not been replicated. This is a much more blatant example of bad science than the first example. You can even call this really bad science. The researchers intentionally changed the data and hid information along with a host of other problems. But this gives us insight into understanding how to spot bad science. Not every study published that sounds legit is, and not every study published in a seemingly reputable journal is. This is exactly why people's mistrust for science is growing and growing. This second example shows how important it is that you look under the hood of things you read online to see what parts are really under there. And if you haven't had the time to do so, it's perfectly okay to not have an opinion. You can say, you know, I'm still researching X, Y, and Z, and I don't have an answer for that yet. That's perfectly okay. And in fact, more people should probably do that. Now that we've inverted the problem and considered some of the signs of bad science, let's look at some of the indicators that a study is likely to be trustworthy. Unfortunately, there is no single sign a piece of research is good science. None of the signs mentioned here are alone in any way conclusive. There are caveats and exceptions to them all. They are simply factors to evaluate. A journal, any journal, publishing a study says little about its quality as we saw from the previous example. Some will publish any research they receive in return for a fee. A few so-called vanity publishers claim to have a peer review process, yet they typically have a short gap between receiving a paper and publishing it. We're talking days or weeks, not the expected months or years in most peer review processes. Many predatory publishers do not even make any attempt to verify quality. No journal is perfect, of course, even the most respected journals make mistakes and publish low quality work sometimes. However, anything that is not published research or based on published research in a journal is not worth consideration, not as science. A blog post saying green smoothies cured someone's eczema is not comparable to a published study. The barrier for that is way too low. If someone cared enough about using a hypothesis or finding to improve the world and educate others, they would make the effort to get it published. Peer-reviewed is a standard process in academic publishing. It's intended as an objective means of assessing the quality and accuracy of new research. Uninvolved researchers with relevant experience evaluate papers before publication. They consider factors like how well it builds upon pre-existing results or if the results are statistically significant, peer review should also be double-blinded. This means researchers don't know who's reviewing the work and the reviewers don't know whose researchers they're reviewing. The number of reviewers and strictness of the process depends on the journal. Reviewers either declare a paper unpublishable or suggest improvements. It is rare for them to suggest publishing without modifications. Sometimes several rounds of modification prove necessary and that's okay. It can take years for a paper to see the light of day, which is no doubt frustrating for the researcher, but it ensures no or at least fewer mistakes or weak areas. Pseudoscientific practitioners will often claim they cannot get their work published because peer reviewers suppress anything contradicting prevailing doctrines. Good researchers, however, know having their work challenged and argued against it is positive. It makes them stronger. They don't shy away from it. So that can be another example of bad science. If a researcher is trying to get their paper published over and over and over again and doesn't want any critiques or doesn't want to change anything, that might be a good sign that that's either bad science or pseudoscience. 
One of the big red flags in the green coffee bean study was that the researchers involved had no medical background or experience publishing obesity-related research. While outsiders can sometimes make important advances, researchers should have relevant qualifications and a history of working in that field. It is much too difficult to make scientific advancements without the necessary background knowledge and expertise. If someone cares enough about advancing a given field, they will study it. Another indicator of good science is that it's part of a larger body of work. On the whole, science does not progress in great leaps. It moves along millimeter by millimeter by millimeter, gaining evidence in increments. Even if a piece of research is presented as groundbreaking, it has years of work behind it. Researchers do not work in isolation. Good science is rarely, if ever, the result of one person or even one organization. It comes from a monumental collective effort. So when evaluating research, it is very important to see if other studies point to similar results and if it is an established field of work. For this reason, meta-analyses, which analyze the combined results of many studies on the same topic, are often far more useful to the public than just individual studies. Science is about evidence, not reputation. Sometimes well-respected researchers, for whatever reason, produce bad science. Sometimes outsiders produce amazing science. What matters is the evidence they have to support it. While an established researcher may have an easier time getting support for their work, the overall community accepts work on merit. When we look to examples of unknowns who made extraordinary discoveries out of the blue, they always had extraordinary evidence for it. It must be said that questioning the existing body of research is not inherently bad science or pseudoscience. We never want anyone to think that. It's actually good to question established norms and what people think they already know is true, but doing so without a remarkable amount of evidence is generally frowned upon. Studies that promise anything a bit too amazing can be suspect. This is more common in media reporting of science or in the research used for advertising. In medicine, a panacea is something that can supposedly solve all or many health problems. It's like coffee for me, solves every problem I ever have. But these claims are rarely substantiated by anything even resembling evidence. The more outlandish the claim, the less likely it is to be true. Occam's razor teaches us that the simplest explanation with the fewest inherent assumptions is most likely to be true. This is a useful heuristic for evaluating potential magic bullets. Another key thing to pay attention to is whether or not it avoids or at least discloses potential conflict of interests. A conflict of interest is anything that incentivizes producing a particular result. It distorts the pursuit of truth. A government study into the health risks of recreational drug use will be biased towards finding evidence of negative risks. A study of the benefits of breakfast cereal funded by a cereal company will be biased towards finding plenty of benefits. Researchers do have to get funding from somewhere, of course, so this does not automatically make a study bad science. But research without conflicts of interest is more likely to be good science. The next factor to evaluate is whether or not it proves to claim anything based on one single study. In the vast majority of cases, a single study is a starting point, not proof of anything. The result could be random chance or even the result of bias or outright fraud sometimes. Only once other researchers replicate the results can we consider a study persuasive. The more replications, the more reliable the results are. If attempts at replication fail, this can be a sign the original research was biased or incorrect. A good sample size represents the wider population, not one segment of it. If it does not, then the results may only be relevant for people in that demographic and not everyone. Bad science will often also use very small sample sizes, as we saw in the previous example of 42 participants. There is no set target for what makes a large enough sample size. It all depends on the nature of the research. But in general, the larger, the better. The exception is in studies that may put subjects at risk which use the smallest possible sample to achieve usable results. In areas like nutrition and medicine, it's also important for a study to last a long time. A study looking at the impact of a supplement on blood pressure over a week is far less useful than one that does so over a decade. The points raised in this video are all aimed at the linchpin of the scientific method. We cannot necessarily prove anything. 
we must consider the most likely outcome given the information we have. Bad science is generated by those who are willfully ignorant or are so focused on trying to prove their hypothesis that they fudge results and cherry pick to shape their data to their biases. The problem with this approach is that it transforms what could be empirical and scientific into something subjective and ideological. Bad science is not when an experiment disproves a hypothesis. In fact, that is very good science. It only becomes bad science when the scientists try to cherry pick and change their data and everything to confirm said hypothesis instead of actually disproving it like the data shows. When we look to disprove what we know, we are able to approach the world with a more flexible way of thinking. If we are unable to defend what we know with reproducible evidence, we may need to reconsider our ideas and adjust our worldviews accordingly. Only then can we properly learn and begin to make forward steps.